Hi, this is the sixth and last video reviewing general relativity in a bottom-up fashion. In this video, we look at how space expands and the resulting redshift. We'll study the three classical Friedman models and how they change with dark energy. We'll look at cosmological horizons and see how a galaxy that always recedes faster than light still can be visible. We'll also look at inflation, the multiverse, and gravitational waves. That's a lot of stuff, so let's get started. As before, let's visualize flat space in three dimensions. And let's divide space into voxels, where each voxel is one unit in X, Y, and Z. Even though space is flat, we arrange the voxels spherically, because in cosmology, we often think of space as a sphere around us, the observer, at the origin. It's difficult to see through, so we'll take a slice in the equatorial plane. And flat space continues forever, even though we don't show it all. And as we saw in the first video, you can make a square in flat space. Now we're going to mess with the curvature using this dial. First, we'll look at positive curvature, so let's move the needle a little bit. With positive curvature, space is no longer infinite. Here we show nine rings of voxels. This three-dimensional sphere is very similar to the two-dimensional surface in the second video. We see that voxels far from the center get stretched out, so there are only a few of them, kind of like near the south pole on the flat map. We also see that the square no longer closes right. Next, we're going to increase the curvature. Pay attention. You'll see that we get a smaller space and that the square is even less of a square. Here we go. You may remember that the geodesics on a sphere were loops. This means that if you go straight, you follow a geodesic, and after some time, you end up where you started. This is the sort of stuff I first discovered reading science fiction. Now, depending on the exact location, the geodesic is more or less of a distorted circle. As a side note, you can move the geodesic just right and get a straight line. What happens as you move along this geodesic to the edge? Well, that depends on what the boundary condition happens to be. If the boundary condition is cyclic, we get a Pac-Man effect where the particle reappears on the other side. This is the case if the sphere curves around in an external dimension, kind of like the two-dimensional surface or planet Earth curves around, and the edge becomes the South Pole. On the other hand, there may be no such wraparound, and the boundary condition may result in a reflection. An observer may happen to be in the center of this finite universe and measure it with sticks. But if she is in another part, she still measures the universe around her to be the same in all directions, because the sticks are now distorted. As always, we humans consider ourselves the center of the universe. Okay, so let's go back to flat space and see what happens when we dial up negative curvature. Well, the opposite happens. First, space is infinite, then the square opens up, and the number of voxels increases in rings that are far away. Here we go. And again, if we, the observer, move to a different place and then remeasure the voxels at that point, the universe still looks the same. Geometry is in the eye of the guy with the measuring stick. Let's look at one dimensional space. In this universe, there are some particles at rest. In this case, they are three units apart. When the universe expands, it's as if more space is being added. The particles don't move relative to space, but there's now more distance between them. In the video, we add rather large voxels. In reality, we should think of space as appearing everywhere continuously. Now, instead of coordinate x, Let's change to coordinate chi, which looks like a curly X in the top right corner. Chi is also a space coordinate, but it changes with time, just so that the particles don't move. 
chi is called the co-moving coordinates. The position of the particles, which are at rest, now really do look as if they are at rest, but the trade-off is that the sticks and particles shrink along with the voxels. We can add clocks next to some of the particles. The clocks are also at rest. These special clocks measure something called cosmic time, and such clocks are always synchronized. Any other clock that moves will measure less time. As we know from special relativity, this is what happens when you move relative to space. But what happens to particles that move? Well, if the particle is a photon, it has no mass, and it moves at the speed of light, one. These are two flashes, or we can think of them as the crests of a single wave. In the beginning, they are three units apart. As they move, space is added between them, and in the video, they seem to move more slowly because the voxels shrink. At the end, they are six units apart. In other words, they've been redshifted. The speed is still one, but only 50% of the energy is left. The thing that has really been cut in half is the momentum, and this is also true for particles that have mass. For example, here we have a neutrino that moves almost at the speed of light. At the end, it lost half its momentum, but the speed only decreased a little bit. The energy is not quite cut in half, because some of the energy is in the rest mass of the neutrino, which doesn't change. Finally, let's look at a slow particle. It's boring to watch the bullet move slowly, so we'll speed it up in the video. Now most of the energy is in the rest mass, and very little is kinetic energy. So when the momentum is cut in half, the velocity is cut in half, but almost all of the energy is left. A little later, we'll use these numbers to look at how different types of mass energy dominate at different times, and how pressure can be positive or negative. Now let's look at the three classical Friedman universes. We'll go back to a proper x-coordinate, where voxels stay the same size. And instead of time being just video time, we'll have time run upward. We'll start with the flat universe, where the density of matter is exactly some critical density between an open and closed universe. The flat universe is infinite, but let's only show a small portion with three particles. Let's indicate the flatness with a square that correctly joins up with 90 degree angles. All right, now we're ready to let our universe expand. As before, the particles really stay in place, but space is added between them. Note that the universe that starts out flat remains flat. In our dial, the yellow pointer looks like an upside down pendulum. When it's perfectly balanced, straight up, then it stays there forever. Also note that the rate of expansion slows down with time. It's decelerating. Let's add a speedometer and run that again. For a flat universe, the expansion rate goes towards zero. An open Friedman universe looks similar to a flat one in that it keeps expanding, but at a faster rate. Look closely and we'll see more differences. First, the density of particles is less. We end up with some negative curvature, which we see both in the yellow dial and also in the square of sticks, which is now open. When we animate it, look at the two dials. Again, the speedometer shows that the rate of expansion decelerates, but not towards zero. And meanwhile, the curvature gets more negative. We see this both in the yellow pointer and in the square of sticks. Let's run that one more time. The third Friedman universe is closed. The initial expansion stops, and then we get a big crunch. Notice how the curvature increases only during the first half, when the expansion decelerates. 
When it again accelerates, the curvature becomes more flat. Let's run that one more time. So we have the three classical Friedman universes, open, flat, and closed. They are filled with regular matter, the yellow particles, and the matter slows the expansion. The more matter, the more deceleration. But these days, we believe that about 70% of the contents is not regular matter, but dark energy. How does this affect the Friedman universes? Well, if we keep the total density the same, but change the composition, this is what we get. At later times, the deceleration changes into acceleration. This seems to have happened in our universe when it was about 5 billion years old. Let's focus on this version of the universe, which is called the concordance model. There's a lot going on here, so let's try to simplify. First, we saw that the total density of mass and energy causes the curvature to be negative, zero, or positive. It doesn't matter what the composition is, just the total density. The composition does matter for the rate of expansion. With more dark energy, we tend toward acceleration. Finally, with deceleration, the curvature moves away from flat. Look at the two pointers. The opposite happens with acceleration. The universe becomes more flat. And this is true whether the curvature started out slightly negative or slightly positive. Now, the composition changes over time. How does this happen? Well, let's use a little bit of high school chemistry, like the ideal gas law. The gas in a box has a pressure, a force on the walls, and a total energy. If the box expands, the gas does work on the walls, and the energy for that work is taken from the gas. Now let's see how this works for the three types of mass energy. We saw before that when space expands by a factor of two, then photons and neutrinos, which move at about the speed of light, they lose half of their energy. This loss of energy means two things. First, they contribute less to the mass energy of the universe. And second, the pressure was positive, just like for the ideal gas. On the other hand, slow matter only loses a little bit of energy, so the pressure is very small. And dark energy is usually assumed to be constant per volume. So when the volume increases by a factor of 8, then the energy increases by 8. In other words, dark energy contributes more, and the pressure must be negative. To summarize, as time passes, radiation becomes less important, and dark energy becomes more important. So at early times, radiation dominated, then slow matter dominated, and then today, dark energy dominates. One more thing about our curvature dial. Our universe has mostly been decelerating, and then we saw that it becomes more and more curved. The thing is, today we seem to be close to flat, within 2%. But even if it's off by 10%, the universe must have been incredibly flat at the time of the Big Bang. Why would it have started out so very flat? Well, there may have been intense acceleration in the first fraction of a second. This is called inflation and would have been caused by some other kind of dark energy that totally dominated in the very beginning and drove the curvature to be very, very close to zero. Just to avoid confusion, when we compare the density for open, flat, and closed, this is the density at some given time, for example today, when the rate of expansion is some given value. As the universe expands, that density does decrease, and the critical density for a flat universe 
changes with size and expansion rates. It turns out that space can recede faster than the speed of light. Here our observer is looking toward three firecrackers, or galaxies. They emit light, and the light travels toward the observer. However, depending on the distance, space expands so fast that one of them is actually receding. We should point out that objects never move faster than light, not relative to local space, nor relative to local objects. It's just space itself that's expanding. Now, the middle photon is just at the point where the recession is the same as the speed of light. This distance is called the Hubble distance, and if the expansion rate is constant, we cannot see objects that are further away. If the expansion rate increases, then the point where space recedes at the speed of light will be closer to the observer. In other words, the Hubble distance gets smaller. And if the expansion rate decreases, then the Hubble distance gets larger. Because the Hubble distance can shrink and grow, galaxies can cross it in both directions. Therefore, the Hubble distance is not a horizon, because horizons are one way. But there are horizons. Let's follow one galaxy, or firecracker, from very early times, when the expansion rate is fast and the Hubble distance is small. As the universe expands, it moves away, but emits a constant stream of photons. At first, these photons recede because they are beyond the Hubble distance. But then the universe decelerates, and the Hubble distance grows and reaches the photons. Finally, the first photon reaches the observer. This is the first time that the firecracker is visible. It has crossed the horizon. That's called the particle horizon. The firecracker is now the most distant thing that is visible. The firecracker is at the particle horizon, and the distance to that firecracker today in our universe is about 47 billion light years. We call this distance the radius of the visible universe. Now there are still many flashes in flight. Let's color some of them gray. The ones that are still blue will eventually reach the observer, but the gray ones will not because of accelerated expansion. Let's look at that. Now let's rewind to where the first gray flash was emitted. The distance at that time is called the event horizon. The emission of a flash is an event, and flashes emitted before crossing the event horizon can be seen by the observer, but not later flashes. There are two things that may seem counterintuitive. The first is that the firecracker is always receding faster than light, and still we can see it. Let's play the whole scenario back again, and you'll see that the firecracker always is beyond the point where the expansion rate is C. The second counterintuitive thing is that even though the firecracker leaves the event horizon, it remains visible. How can this be? Well, it's the light emitted just before it leaves the event horizon that's visible. Let's go forward to that point. Now we're just about to get the first gray light flash. Before that happens, let's emit a burst of blue flashes. Now as we continue, these blue flashes take a very long time to reach the observer. The very last one takes forever. They hover just at the Hubble distance, where the expansion rate is C. And during this time, the stretching of the universe causes an extreme redshift. In other words, once a galaxy enters the particle horizon, it remains inside it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called an horizon. So we just saw that we can only see a portion of the universe. The whole thing may be enormously bigger than the visible part. We also saw that early on, there may have been inflation, a period of exponential expansion. Let's paint space-time red when it's inflating. At some point, this dark energy decays or has a phase transition. When this happens, we get an ordinary Big Bang where light and matter is created. 
Let's move forward in time and let that big bang expand. We use white to show this ordinary space that is not inflating, just expanding. And as we saw, only a portion of that space is visible, which we mark in blue. Now outside this bubble of normal space, inflation keeps going exponentially. To make things easier to visualize, let's change to the co-moving coordinate chi, where particles at rest in the inflating space don't move. The normal universe now gets squeezed into what looks like a bubble. It does continue forward in time, but gets too narrow to see. Now let's zoom out a bit so that we can see what happens when we move forward in time. The phase transition that caused a Big Bang and a bubble of normal space could very well happen at other points in space-time. Here we see four more bubbles, four more Big Bangs, and there could be an infinite number of them. The collection of all these bubbles is called a multiverse. Our visible universe would be just a small part of one of these many bubbles. We're done with the universe. Before we finish, let's look at one other case where space expands and contracts. We have two points and some distance between them. Then space expands and contracts and expands and contracts. What is this? Well, it's a gravitational wave. It causes the measured distance between two points to vary in a cycle. Now we can bounce light between the mirrors. Let's first add a second dimension of space and a beam splitter and another mirror and a detector. Light is split at the beam splitter, but the distances can be carefully adjusted so that interference at the beam splitter cancels any light in the direction toward the detector. But when the wave passes by, the distances change, and light now arrives at the detector. This experiment is LIGO, which detected gravitational waves in 2016 and earned a Nobel Prize in 2017. That's it! We're done reviewing the theory of relativity. I recommend that you watch the videos again, then move on to the videos on quantum mechanics, which turns out to not be weird in the substrate viewpoint. For more videos, go to physicsisnotweird.com. And I'm Avon Bernander.